Oh, no, we left we're trying. we did a pre-briefing and we're we trying. went over we went over that but he's gone he's ready yes, 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 okay and you good with sound that's the best shot yeah. okay that's perfect all cell phones on silent <laughs> where are we going <laughs> double check before okay so just relax and i know you can tell your story better than anybody <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Okay now, mm -hmm. okay. I had the good fortune of having been born in Atlanta. I was born at Gray Hospital. And I'm <clears throat> what they refer to as a Grady baby. Okay, let's start with your name though first. Your okay. name and then your title and then you can go into that. So we're going to start over okay. in three, two, one. I am Leroy Johnson. I'm a graduate of Booker T. Washington High School, but my great school was Mohouse College. I graduated of Mohouse College and decided to go to Atlanta University for a degree in political science. I had great professors that influenced me to go into the law. And I finished North Carolina Central University College uh, in North Carolina and returned to Atlanta to uh, go into the district attorney's office. And I was in the district attorney's office about three or four years. And I passed the bar while I was in the district attorney's office and I set up my own law practice. And I have practiced law in the state of Georgia for 54 years. And during that process, I had an opportunity to run for the Senate of Georgia. Uh, in 1962, I was during the period of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and I ran for the Senate uh, from the 38th District. Uh, the county unit system had been destroyed by a federal case which says one man, one vote. And so I ran for the, for the legislature of Georgia. I was fortunate I got elected to the Georgia legislature. The first time a black person had been elected to the legislature of Georgia in 100 years. In 1862, about that time, the Georgia legislature had 12 black members of that legislature and they expurged, they put all of them out. And so it wasn't until 1962 when I ran for the office that a black man had been elected to the legislature of Georgia. And at that time, all the facilities in the state capitol were segregated. There were signs over the water fountains saying colored and white. There was signs on their doors of the restrooms saying colored and white. And a black person had never eaten in the state cafeteria. And black person had never sat in the balcony of the state senate. And a black boy and girl had never served as a page in the state capital of Georgia. And so my objective and my purpose was clear. I had to first desegregate the state capitol. And I did so by, every senator can appoint pages, that is, boys and girls, to aid them during that, uh, during that day. And the pages that I appointed, <clears throat> I had them to drink water from the fountain which says white. And I had them go to the men's bathroom, which says white men only. Uh, that said white. And I continued to do that for about three weeks, carrying the boys, having the boys to drink from the fountain that says white, go to the restroom that says white, and the same for the girls that I appointed. And about three and a half weeks, the signs all came down over the water fountains and, over the, and from the doors of the restaurant. I mean, from the doors of the bathroom. 
Now, what is so important is that a black person never ate in the state cafeteria. And so I decided to go with one of my friends from Fulton County, decided to go to the uh, restaurant. And uh, his name was Joe Salome. He was a part of the Fulton County delegation. And so we went to the have, a, have to have lunch in the state cafeteria. And the lady stopped us at the door and says, uh, you can't come in here. We don't uh, serve uh, uh, Negroes. And I told her I was a senator from the 38th District, you know, with all the rights and privileges appertaining there too. And she said, well, you're not going to eat in here. And I suggested to her to go and see her supervisor. So she went, she left and came back, came back in about 15 minutes and says, all right, come in. So we went in, got our food, went to the place where we had to, to the cash, cashiers, and we paid for the food, and walked into the to the cafeteria. Well, the seating arrangement was that you had these long tables and you had people sitting on each side of the table to eat. Well, we looked around, and finally we saw a table where white people were sitting on one side, but there was a there was a two, three vacancies on the other side of the table. So Joe Salome, who was with me, uh, went, we went to that particular table and he put his tray down and I followed him and I put my tray down. And when I put my tray down on the table, all the white people got up from the table and left. So we sat there to eat. And then a few minutes later, all of the white people at the table across from us, next to us, left. And within 10 minutes, all the tables around us, where had all white people were sitting to eat, they picked up their food and left. And so we had a whole area by ourselves. Uh, and I said to Joe, I said, Joe, we have a private area that we're eating now in the state cafeteria of, um, of uh, the state capitol. But we desegregated the state capitol. And the next day, I had my friend QB Williamson, who was a black uh, member of the board of, of, of the city council. I called him, and he went to lunch with me. But that's the way we desegregated the city council. And what is so important in my story is that when I was elected in 62 and took office in 63, not one senator from South Georgia or North Georgia spoke to me. I would walk down the hall and meet a senator going in the opposite direction. And I would say, good morning, Senator. And his reply would be, mm, mm. And that happened continuously for the whole session. None of them would speak. And so that was an experience that, that I had. And I had to do two things. Number one, I had to make certain that they knew that a black man could be just an effective senator as a white man. If he had this educational ability, and I finished Mohouse, I finished Atlanta University, and got a law degree from North Carolina Central Law School. So I had the credentials. It wasn't the credentials that they were concerned about, but they just didn't speak to me because I was black and that they were white. And, uh, but that was a part of my of my history. Uh, I had the good fortune of finishing a great school like Mohouse. And Mohouse awarded me the ben e Benjamin E. Mays Trailblazing Award, which was one of the great awards that, that Mohouse gave. And so uh, that was just a part of my background. I'm now writing my memoirs, and I hope to finish within the next four or five months, which will tell this story of my journey of a black man in a white man's legislature. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the markers we're going to put up will acknowledge um, the efforts of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You want to talk about SNCC? SNCC was an organization of students who had to come together 
to coordinate the activities of students throughout the South in Georgia, Arkansas, uh, uh, Virginia, uh, all the students was moving to desegregate uh, that particular area, wherever they were, that state or that city. And SNCC was, had a very important role to try to coordinate their activities to make sure that they were, had some sufficient uh, uh, assistance and doing whatever they wanted to do to make sure that they were uh, properly uh, organized to do what they wanted to do. And so in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, all of those states, SNCC was first headquarters in Baltimore, I believe. But anyway, they came to Atlanta, and the headquarters was in Atlanta. And Julian Bond uh, was one of the great leaders there. And, uh, and uh, there's another young lady who worked with Julian uh, uh, in SNCC. The, but they were in a very effective organization and very needed because you had to coordinate the activities. And the students wanted to do something to make certain that they were treated equally as other people. And let's talk about the desegregation of city well, before you move on, did, uh, what, did, did you have, have the occasion, Senator, to work with John Lewis when he was in SNCC in Atlanta? Or? John, John Lewis was a part of SNCC. John Lewis, Julian Bond, and another young lady, I can't remember her name now, uh, was the kind of the head uh, honcho was in in, in SNCC. Uh, but my compass, my contact was mainly with uh, Lenny King uh, from Mohouse, Ben Brown from Clark, Herschel Sullivan from uh, Spellman, uh, and and students from that university system. Uh, and uh, but they were the they were the the whole uni whole, they, they were the leaders of the Atlanta University group system of students in the student movement. Thing. But I didn't have the opportunity to work very closely with John Lewis. Right, and that was Ruby Dora Smith. You were. Ru yes, Ruby Dora Smith was with uh, with Snake. Yes. yes. Um, the desegregation of municipal facilities, and you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, let me say this, because it is, I think, necessary. Most Atlanta think about the desegregation of Atlanta because of the lunch counters, you see. And there is a belief that the Civil Rights Act of 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education, which says that schools in this country was desegregated, that that desegregated the whole South. But Brown versus the Board of Education desegregated schools, the school system in America. But Brown versus the Board of Education did not desegregate the city of Atlanta. It was the student movement that desegregated the city of Atlanta. And I'm not so sure that we actually give credit to the students for that specific uh, job. But when you look at it, it was the uncompromising uh, position of the student against an evil system of segregation using a nonviolent method of, of uh, marching and desegregating the city that desegregated Atlanta. The, the it was great, the, the Civil Rights Act of, uh, of 1954 was a great act and was slow in coming, but it did not segregate Atlanta. What segregated Atlanta was, number one, the suit that the student movement members filed, Brown versus the city of Atlanta. And Brown versus the city of Atlanta desegregated all the city facilities that were segregated the auditoriums, the, the, the theaters, the arenas, uh, the parks, 
uh, that decision desegregated the the uh, the laws of Atlanta dealing with segregation. The second thing that happened because of the pseudo student movement was the desegregation of restaurants and and hotels. Uh, the governor of Georgia, who was less dramatic, owned a restaurant called the Pickwick. And he stood in the door with an ax and says, no black people will eat in this restaurant, see. And the students protested, and then they went to the heart of Atlanta motel for rooms, and they wouldn't permit them to come in, and they protested that. And so the heart of Atlanta filed a suit against the United States government saying that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did not apply to them. And the court ruled just the reverse. The court said that the 1964 Civil Rights Act applied across the board and throughout America. And so a restaurant was desegregated and the whole motel was desegregated, all because of the pressure that the, that the student movement had, uh, had brought about. And so those were the things that desegregated the Atlanta, along with the desegregation of the counters downtown, that is the Rich's department store. Now everybody know about Rich's. They do not know about Brown versus the city of Atlanta. They do not know about the uh, hotel suit, but they know about the, the, the lunch counter situation, and that's very important. What happened there was that Lonnie King and the civil and the students had to make a decision. They were going every day uh, protesting and demonstrating in the downtown area, mainly the richest department store and other, and other, but mainly riches and other lunch counters. But riches, the head of riches represented the uh, persons involved in the chain of commerce for all downtown markets, see? So they just hammered away at riches. As a result of that, uh, that's where the desegregation came in. Now let me tell you the story about that. The students were animate in their attack, an attack meaning their marching on downtown, and they did it religiously every day. I had a personal interest because I had learned to have a great uh, interest in Lonnie King. Lonnie King was eight, 19 or 20, and he had to make great decisions. And a young person making those kind of decisions it was an awful burden on him, but he, he, he stepped up to the plate. And there was a great meeting at Memorial uh, Church. Is, is it Memorial? It's, it's uh, Warren, Warren, Warren Memorial. Church. Warren Memorial Church. This was, a, this was the essence of the civil rights movement, the height of the civil rights movement downtown. What happened was, is that the students had put so much pressure on the downtown merchants that they got with the members of the, the black members of the, of the of Atlanta, which included A. T. Walden, uh, C. A. Baycoat, uh, uh, Warren Cochran, uh, and many other leaders. Uh, and they tried to work out a, a proposal to stop the, the demonstrations. So they came up with a proposal, and the proposal suggested that if the student would stop demonstrating for six months, they would desegregate Atlanta, uh, the hotels and uh, the restaurants in Atlanta, downtown, the downtown restaurants, including the um, the riches and other stores. That was the proposal. Lonnie King and others had to respond to that, and black leaders were telling them that this is something that you ought to do, and, and they did not trust all black leaders, 
and they didn't trust any of the white leaders downtown area. So it was it was a it was a tremendous burden that they had to to make. So they decided to go ahead with the with the uh, with the decision to accept the proposal. Well, when they got back to the student body at Atlanta University, the students all thought it was the worst thing that could happen. They reneged on it. We do not want this to happen, see. So Lonnie King says, I'm gonna have to reverse it. I, we cannot accept this. And he called a meeting for a meeting at War Memorial Church. The pastor of that church was um, Reverend Creasy. And uh, so we, we had a meeting there. That meeting, the church was packed on that night. And the students were there, and the Atlanta black community was there. And the question was whether or not the students would accept. They said, no, we're not going to accept it, whether they would reverse that decision and accept the proposal of the merchants downtown. Black leaders began to speak, asking them to do that. Two speeches are important. One was from A.T. Walden. A.T. Walden was one of the first black lawyers in Atlanta. And he was the first black munis appointed municipal judge uh, in Atlanta and in the South. And he represented what the students would refer to as the old God. And he spoke that night and told the students that if they would accept the proposal, that he, Walden, would march with them if the white people uh, reneged on their promise. The students did not accept that. The students did not believe that. For some reason, they didn't have the trust in Walden uh, that maybe some of us thought they should have had, but they had a reason for not. And other black leaders spoke at that meeting, asking the students to reconsider their, their decision. But the thing that saved the meeting, the one speech that saved the meeting, and causes, caused the, the students to change their mind, was a speech by Martin Luther King, Jr. I was on the stage, I was on the platform where, where, they, where they were speaking. And he said to the students, among other things, if you decide to accept the recommendation of the white merchants and, uh, and stop marching, stop your, de your, distrim your, uh, your uh, demonstration, say, if you decide to do that, I, Martin Luther King Jr., will march with you if they reneged on their word, if they say they Continue, sorry. If, if they say that they're not going to, to do it, I will march with you. It was that speech that electrified the audience. It was that speech. But for that, they would never change their mind. When Martin Luther King said, I will march with you if they renege, if they decide that they're not going to desegregate the counters, after you have stopped your demonstration, I will march with you. That was the height of the meeting. Now, Wallen said the same thing, but the students didn't believe that. The students did believe in Martin Luther King, Jr. And they reversed their position and say, we will accept the proposal of the merchants from downtown. And they did that, and the demonstration stopped for six months. At the end of the six months, the Riches and the other kept their word and desegregated downtown. And that's what happened, and that's the story. Okay, let's talk about the Atlanta Inquirer. The Atlanta Inquirer was founded by a professor from Clark University and Jesse Hill. The professor was. Um, and I'll get it for you in just a minute. The professor from Atlanta University, 
and Jesse Hill. And then they had a board of directors. And on the board of directors was uh, uh, was Jesse Hill, uh, Herman Russell, Dr. Uh, Dr. Warner, Dr. Warner, I was on the board of directors. Clarence Coleman was on the board of directors of the Atlanta Inquirer. And the Inquirer was a paper that was in tune with what the student movement was doing. Now we had another newspaper in Atlanta, the Atlanta Daily World, and we had the Atlanta Constitution, Atlanta Journal. Uh, all of them were fine, new, fine papers, but many of them did not reflect the views of the student movement in terms of their goal, their purpose, their ambition, and what they were, what they were marching for. The Atlanta Inquirer became really the newspaper of the student movement because they believed in their goals and their objectives. Uh, they wanted to desegregate Atlanta, and so did the members the Board of Directors of the Atlanta Inquirer wanted to uh, uh, support the, the, the student movement and wanted to improve the welfare of the black folks in Atlanta. The relationship between the Atlanta the Inquirer and the student movement uh, was very significant because it hierarchied and pushed the, the um, newspaper into a most favored position in the community. The Inquirer became a very influential paper in the community. And in the election of, in the, in the meritorial election between Ivan Allen and Muggsy Smith, the Atlanta Inquirer played a very great role. They supported Ivan Allen, and other black leaders supported Muggsy Smith, but Ivan Allen won. So the Atlanta Inquirer became a paper to be reckoned with in Atlanta. Wonderful. Let's talk about the movement lawyers, Donald Hollowell, Howard Moore Jr., and the impact that they had on the Atlanta student movement. At the, the uh, Hollowell, Don Hollowell was a great lawyer, and uh, Moore was a part of uh, his firm. And Vernon Jordan became a part of his firm later on, and so was Horace Ward. All of them were, were great lawyers. All of them were my friends, and all of them had a dedication to human, de human justice. And they did what lawyers was, should do, and they, um, uh, they represented the students. Now, there was a, an adult liaison committee in Atlanta and I was a part of that committee, along with Q.B. Williamson and uh, Clarence Coleman uh, and, and others. But our job as the liaison committee was to provide funds to get the students out of jail and to coordinate the relationship between the students and the community. And we did that. When the student got in jail, Q.B. Williamson uh, put together a, pro, a, uh, a program or a project by which we would provide money for the students to get out of jail. Uh, but um, Hollowell and uh, Ward uh, and Moore uh, did a magnificent job of record, uh, representing the students uh, when called upon to do so. And did you want to talk about the Freedom, freedom Riders and their impact? No, but obviously they had an impact. The, the question was uh, interstate travel, buses, trains, and what have you. And even though the law says segregation had to go, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that when you got inside the bus or the bus station, you had uh, desegregation. You had segregation, and the same was... Uh, and, and, and what happened is that when the students began to begin that movement, 
of traveling from state to state, bus to bus, they discovered that the law said one thing, but the practice was another. The law said you could not have segregation, but the practice was there was segregation in fact. And it was disposing of that that caused that uh, federal government to revise a part of the law and to make certain that in interstate commerce there was no segregation. Yes, uh, Reverend Boone was um, uh, what we refer to as as a person who had made a decision that segregation uh, was wrong, and all of his movement uh, was against segregation and a segregated society. I did not. I was. I, I have not been. I was not a part of. And he had a great movement even in his church dealing with just that issue. I was not a part of that, but I knew of his reputation in the Atlanta community, which one in which was always opposed to segregation and discrimination. And he opened his church to the students, for the students to come in uh, to have meetings, and he uh, gave advice, uh, but it was extremely helpful. And there was very few people like Reverend uh, Boone, John Boone. Uh, he was a great uh, preacher, but his great contribution was his un his commitment against an evil system of segregation. Reverend Joseph Boone. Joseph Boone, yes. Anything else you want to talk about in terms of the the political climate in the city? of Atlanta during the time that the students were mobilizing and the reaction of the politicians to, to these efforts? Perhaps the only thing that I really want to say is that I don't believe that the city of Atlanta, even though they gave Lonnie King an award, I believe, a year ago, uh, but what this took the, the, Atlanta, the student movement was in the 60s, and that's a long time to wait to get an award. And I just don't think that we realize, we meaning Atlantans, realize the real value of the student movement. They think of the student movement, a movement as a movement against the downtown merchant of richest department store and lunch counters. That was the student movement. And that, was, in fact, was not the student movement. That was a part of it. But the Civil Rights Act of 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education, statement was clear to the world that school segregation was, was, would not be tolerated in America. But Brown versus... Pause, sorry. Phone. <laughs> And we'll, we'll just pick up where you left off, and we'll edit the phone ringing out. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think she got it. But I just want to make the, the point that Brown versus the Board of Education. Can I count you in so that we get a clean start? Okay. I'll give you a quick three seconds, all right? Three, two, go. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm that, 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 we, I, that we understand that Brown versus the Board of Education, which was a great decision by the Supreme Court and long overdue, uh, made segregation illegal and uh, segregation of schools illegal in America. But it did not desegregate the city of Atlanta and the facilities in the city of Atlanta and the municipal facilities in the city of Atlanta. It did not do that. The student movement did that. And I think we have to recognize them for that. They desegregated the city of Atlanta. And I think that somewhere in history, the city of Atlanta ought to recognize that fact. I know they're doing a great job in doing, in doing things over by the Atlanta University system, uh, but that's an area which people have to go through who visit it. But if yearly, on the 15th or whatever day they want to choose, that the mayor and the uh, city council would, on television would say thanks to the, uh, to the 
to the, to the student movement for what they did to desegregate Atlanta. Now I'm not talking about closing businesses uh, uh, like they do the Martin Luther King Day. I'm not talking about that. But I'm just talking about a day of recognition that this is what actually happened in Atlanta. We love the Supreme Court decisions dealing with the segregation. But those decisions did not desegregate Atlanta. It was a student movement. And Brown versus City of Atlanta, the, the, the hotel, uh, the Heart of Atlanta Hotel versus United States, uh, and the movement from down, and, and the desegregation movement at Rich's Department Store. Those are the three things that desegregate Atlanta. And I'm real proud to have had a part of it. I'm proud to have served on the, on the committee that had to raise money to get the students out of jail and had to be a part of translating the students' motives and position to the black Atlanta community. I'm proud of having that. And I'm proud of the relationship I developed with, Lawrence, with uh, Lonnie King during that period of time. Did you think of any other questions? Well, uh, Senator, can you tell us anything about the, the myth of Atlanta, the city too busy to hate? And what, what was that, how did that come about, or how did that mythology arise out of the movement? The, um, the, the, the slogan, the, the myth that Atlanta too busy to hate, came about as a result of action that was taken by the mayor of Atlanta, who was Ivan Allen. Uh, Ivan Allen uh, was a far cry from, from Maddox, who was the governor of Georgia. He's a far cry. And he had assisted, he had done things in the in, in moving Atlanta forward that black people approved of. He had a meeting, Ivan had had a meeting at the Butler Street Y, and at that meeting was Walden, Cochran, A.T. Walden, uh, Warren Cochran, the Atlanta thing, um, C.A. Baycoat, um, uh, John Wesley Dobbs, all leaders of the black community. And Ivan Ellen said that he was going to Washington to testify that segregation was wrong, that segregation had to go. Uh, some of the black people in, the, in, the, in that meeting said, that's fine, that's what you ought to do. And other black people said, and there was one or two who said that if you do that, you're going to kill yourself. That is, you're going to be persona non grata to the whole political, white political uh, establishment. If you go to Washington during this time and say that segregation ought to go. And somewhere, Ivan Allen said, or someone said, Atlanta is too busy to hate. But that, that missed, that, that, that came up there. And of course, that was, might have been true for that particular period, but it wasn't true as it related to Atlanta relationship when we had to make the Atlanta do things that they ought to have done. If they were too busy to hate, then the student ought not to have to have the Brown versus the city of Atlanta to desegregate the parks and the and auditorium and arenas and that's why, and things like that, you know. So it turned out to be a good slogan, uh, but it wasn't a slogan that that Atlanta has always lived up to. Uh, but I'm proud of Atlanta uh, because we did have a city where you had great leaders like um, like Ivan Allen and like the, at the editor of the Atlanta Constitution. Uh, and you had the, the chairman of the um, uh, had the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce who was president of the Citizen Trust, Citizen Southern Bank, Mills B. Lane, uh, 
you had Mildred B. Lane, uh, and those leaders made it possible for us not to in, not to have the kind of of, of riot and, and a problem that they had, say, in Birmingham, when they desegregated the when they sought to desegregate the facilities in Birmingham. The, but that's how the the the, the slogan of um, Atlanta is too busy to hate uh, came about. Uh, they was trying to say to Ivan Allen, uh, and Ivan Allen was trying to say that I have to go because Atlanta is too busy to hate. Uh, but uh, that became a good slogan for Atlanta, a PR situation. <laughs> but uh, but that's how it came about. Just a couple. Two, two things more, Senator, uh -huh. before we let you go. That's okay. Uh, I know there was a riot in Summerhill. I think, were you on the scene of that riot? Yeah. As I recall, the story I was told, that you, you were there and you assisted Ivan Allen in, in bringing, I guess, restoring some water. Yes. Is that true? Yes, it is. Uh, there was a riot there, and, I, and I, Ivan Allen came out and I was there, but it was a Stokey Carmichael. Group who was a very, very effective in trying to desegregate uh, uh, all over America, and we had a problem in Summerhill, and it, it came as a result. I think Carmichael was in Atlanta uh, at that time, or he was in, or he was scheduled to come to Atlanta, one or the other. But anyway, we did have a, a problem. It wasn't one that got out of hand to, to the extent to which there was any, any, uh, any death involved. No, nobody was killed, but there was, it was a, a period in which uh, there was, it was a very frightful moment for people who lived in that area as to what would happen there. And uh, we went out and we brought some people in to get to aid and assist in doing some of the things that they said they wanted, like providing for a better area for children to play in. And uh, one thing particularly was that they was concerned about a playground to have an area where people could, where the children could play. Well, what we did was go out there and, and get a lot and had the city to provide certain uh, materials, activity, act, 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 active for that lot, like spring, like swings and and uh, spring and boards and that sort of thing. But it lasted about three days, and uh, and uh, uh, I guess the good thing about it is there was no no one was killed uh, in that process. But it was a disturbance that demanded an attention. And I don't know they would have gotten the attention if, Stok if Carmichael had not come. It probably would have been stayed as it was. But when he came and the people, uh, he spoke out there and uh, they reacted to it. And then there was a disturbance. And of course, my job was to try to make certain that, number one, nobody was hurt, and number two, we could resolve their differences, and we did that. Mm. Yeah. You, and, well, really, there's two things I want to ask about. One is uh, your continued service in the Senate after your initial, I guess, first term. How did the legislators eventually end up interacting with you uh, during this, this, I guess it was a decade, or 12 years you served? Yes. Uh -huh. After the first year, things began to <laughs> after the first year things began to get better, get better meaning this, that for the first year, none of the senators from South Georgia spoke or, or, or North Georgia spoke to me. At the end of the second year, at the end of the first year, I was on a committee. And I was late going to a committee meeting. And when I got to the room where the committee was having a meeting, 
I opened the door and walked in, but before I got there, the, the in a committee meeting, uh, they examine the bills that come in, and they make a determination in that committee meeting whether or not to vote the bills out or to keep them in the, in the committee. If they vote the bill out, then the bill come out of the committee and goes to the floor of the Senate to be voted on. If they if they do not vote the bill out of the committee, the bill would die in the committee. So when I got to the door where the meeting was being held, the meeting had already started, and they had already voted to, to vote some bills out and to keep some in. And when I walked in the door, the senators who was there jumped up from the, some, some of them jumped up from the table and rushed over to me, and some of them actually touched me and said, Senator, I need your vote. Well, what had happened is that they had a tie vote on a bill that was to be reported out, and a tie vote means that the bill stays in the committee. They have to have a majority of the votes to get the bill out of the committee to go to the floor. Well, the votes were tied. I didn't know that when I walked in the door. Those senators got up, rushed over to me, and touched me and said, Senator, I need your vote. Now, this was the first time in the whole session that any senator spoke to me. And when they touched me, I said to myself, what happened to my blackness? But they said, I need your vote. I realized then, if I had never realized it before, the importance of the vote. Those men who had not spoken to me for the whole session, when I walked in, instead of seeing the black senator they had not spoke to, they saw a vote coming in the door, and they wanted my vote. And they rushed over to me, grabbed me by my, put their hands on me, and says, Senator, I need your vote. That was the first time that any of them had spoken to me for the whole session. I knew then the value of the vote. I knew then that in a situation like that, you have to take advantage of the situation. I had two bills that I had already sent to that committee that they had decided that they were going to not vote on. They're going to send it to what they call uh, the cemetery committee. And of course, my negotiation was that if you get my two bills, bring my two bills up and vote them out and, 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 and vote my bills out, I'll vote with you to save your, to send your bill out. They did that in, in, in 10 minutes. My bills was brought up, they voted my bills out. I voted with them and they, uh, their bills went out. But that was the first time that they spoke to me that second. The second year, things were better. And one fella from Enigma, Georgia, one senator from Enigma, Georgia, came up to me and said, Senator, I want to shake your hand. And really apologized to me for not speaking to me for the whole session, the, for the following session. The, but uh, that's what happened. And from then on, I began to move more effectively. Uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, Speaker of the Senate, George T. Smith, appointed me to the first uh, uh, to be chairman of uh, the black uh, the first black chairman of a standing committee and that was the scientific research committee he appointed me there uh, and then later on in my career uh, two or three years later I was appointed as chairman of the Judiciary Committee now the most powerful committees in the Senate is the Judiciary Committee the Finance Committee the Education Committee. Uh, these are the, are the are the really important committees in, in the Senate, and uh, 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 we had a had a situation in the Senate which demanded a vote. In the Senate, there was a rule which says that the President of the Senate names committee chairman. And, and members to the, and members to a committee, that was the rule. Well, Lester Maddox was was the 
president of the Senate at that time. The governor was Carter. Carter wanted to change the rules so that committee chairmen and members of the committee would be appointed by a committee and not by the lieutenant governor. That was the issue. So I sat back and watched the senators on both sides fight with each other. And when it appears that it was going to be very close, Carter came to me, Carter sent for me, and I went to his office. And he said, Senator, I need you to vote with me on this bill. And I said, Governor, I want to be chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And he says, oh, I don't know that I can do that. I don't know, but I'll appoint you chairman of the, of the um, committee dealing with alcohol beverages. Whatever committee, I said I don't want that chairmanship. I want the chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee. And he said to me, I can't do that. And Lester Maddox was working through Cover Kid. Cover Kid was a senator from Milledgeville, his right hand person. He came to me and says, Senator, we need your vote. The Lieutenant Governor needs your vote. I said I want to be chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Cover kids said, I had to go back and discuss it with Maddox. A day later, he came back and said that we'll make you chairman of, of the Judiciary Committee if you vote with us. I went to Carter and I said, Governor, the Lieutenant Governor and his people have offered me the chairmanship of the Judiciary Committee. I would prefer voting with you if you give me that chairmanship. He says, no, I can't do it. I can't do that. He said, that's one of the most important committees in the Senate. I said, Governor, that's why I want it, because it was. He says, I can't do that. But I will make you chairman of the some other kind of committee. I says, I don't want that. So Governor Carter said to me, well, you can't vote with Maddox because Maddox is one of the bad guys. He wears the black hat. I wear the white hat. And he's a segregation, and I'm not. So you can't vote with him. And I said, Governor Carter, you're making a great mistake. You're looking at situation now, and I'm looking at the situation for in the future. If I'm chairman of that committee, it means that any black man coming into this Senate know that he can be chairman of a standing committee. And that's what I'm looking for. So he said to me, well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make name you. So I went back and talked cover kid. I said, kid. I said, senator, I'll go with you, providing that you give me the right to name three persons on the committee. Now the committee was a seven-person committee. If I had the right to name three, and I and, and the chairman can vote also, I would have enough members. I have enough votes to get the bill out of the committee that I wanted. So cover kids said, I have to go back to the governor and find the lieutenant governor and find out. He goes back to Maddox and came back to me later and said, We will do that. We'll make you we'll give you chairmanship of the committee and you'll have the right to appoint three members. You have the right to suggest three members to be appointed. I said, Okay. That was the deal. The vote came up the next day and believe me that somebody up there likes me because the vote was, the determination of who won the vote was by one vote. One vote made the difference. And the Lieutenant Governor Maddox won the vote, made me chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And I appointed the first, we had an office, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee had an office in the Senate. The first black to have an office in the Senate. I appointed the first black secretary female secretary to the committee, to that, that, that uh, being in the state capital for my committee, and I appointed the first black person to serve as a, as an administrative assistant. And that person was a Mohawk graduate, and his father was a lawyer that served with, oh, I have his name in just a minute, that served with um, 
His father was a lawyer that I knew well, but his son was at Mohouse, and I appointed him as the first black assistant to a standing committee in the Senate. And so at that point, uh, I had no problems with the senator speaking to me and not speaking to me. From that point on, uh, I, I, I was accepted, what I think, into the inner sanctum. I was, began to, to move with, with effectiveness. But what I learned from that experience is that in politics, you get not what you deserve, but what you can negotiate. Now, I deserved the chairmanship because I was qualified. I had a lawyer, a degree from Mohouse, a degree from Atlanta University in political science, a degree from the uh, from my law school. So I, it wasn't a question of of, of, of credentials. The, but I learned that that in politics, you get not what you deserve, but what you can negotiate. And I was able to negotiate that very effectively. But that's a part of, that's a part of, uh, Michael, of my, uh, my relationship. One other thing, let me just say, when I knew that I had been accepted by the senators, I was a member of the finance committee and a senator by the name of Hollis, Senator Hollis, from Albany, Georgia, was chairman of the Finance Committee. Well, there were about 25 people on the Finance Committee. So Senator Hollis came to me on that particular day and said, Senator, uh, we're having a meeting upstairs on the third floor uh, during the lunch period. He said, come up and meet with us. I said, okay. He didn't tell me what the meeting was about or anything like that. So I was went to lunch and I didn't hurry back, but when I got back, they were already, the meeting had started. And there were about 13 senators up there, all around the big table. And they were sitting there, doling out. They were sitting there determining what these 13 senators needed from the budget to go back into their district. And when I walked in the room, I sat there, and they asked Senator Kidd, said, Senator Kidd, what do you need? And said, he says, I need $50,000 for Millisville Hospital or something of that nature. And they go to around the table and say, what do you need, Senator? One, one senator from uh, from uh, uh, North Georgia said, I need $25,000 $25, for something in his district. And he went around the table, and every one of them said they needed whatever they needed from, from out of the budget, see? Well, I sat there with, with amazement because I always thought when we got to the finance, to the uh, for the to the committee meeting, the question came up about who was going to get what. As always done in the committee meeting, you have to stand up and you have to say what you wanted and have to justify it and you have to vote on it. See, that was not so. They upstairs determined how the money was to be spent on those who were there, and there was 13 of there. So when it got to me. The Senator Hollis says, Senator, what do you need? So I said, Senator, excuse me just a minute. I have to go to the men's room. I said, I'll be right back. So I went out of the meeting, picked up the phone, and called the Urban League, talked to Clarence Coleman. And I said, Clarence, I got an opportunity to get some money for the Urban League, but I got to have a program, a project. Do you have anything? He said, we have a program of trying to teach black folks how to pass a merit examination and says we need about $50,000 to do that as seed money. I said, okay, class, that's all I need. I go back into the committee meeting, and then when Senator Hollis gets back to me, he says, Senator, what you need? I said, Senator, I need $50,000 to teach Georgians 
how to pass the civil service bill, how to pass the civil service bill. He says, okay, who do you want to handle it? What, what source of government do you want to handle it? I said, I want it to be handled through the Department of Labor. And that was Sam Caldwell, who was chairman of the, who was commissioner of labor. But he was my dear friend. So I said, I want to handle it through the commission of labor. He said, okay. So I got my $50,000 in the budget. We went back downstairs after the meeting. After, after he called the meeting to order, the, the chairman did. And they went through the budget as if the meeting upstairs had never taken place. But one thing he said before he adjourned the meeting upstairs, he says, what we have decided on here, I'm expecting all of you to vote when we get downstairs. And I want you to swear in blood. I've never heard this before. I want you to swear in blood that you'll support the decision that we made here. Everybody said yes. They go downstairs, and we had the meeting of the of the uh, finance committee. They voted the budget out, how the money was to be spent, and that was it. It was only on that occasion that I realized at last that I had been kind of accepted by the senators because that wasn't a meeting that everybody knew about. That was a meeting that took place only in the finance committee and when Hollis asked me to come. Yes, sir, we're speeding. Okay. I think it's amazing. That's the same Lester Maddox uh, that appointed you chair of the Judicial Commission. They used to keep black people out of this restaurant with Act Town. That's amazing to me. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, but the, what I'd like for you to comment on is it's something you're famous for. But, uh, using your skill at the Georgia legislature to help a world figure, uh, Muhammad Ali. How did you aid and assist him in returning to the ring? That is, okay, I'm sorry, I got to look at you. <laughs> okay, but that's one of the things that I think that is at the top of my list in terms of my personal contribution. Uh, I was sitting in my office and I got a call from a fellow by the name of Harry Pett. He had a son-in-law in New York who was in the boxing area business and he had called Harry Pett and said that some 56 cities had turned Ali down. He could not get a license to, to, to box. And if he knew, if Harry Pitt knew anybody in Atlanta who could get a license for Ali. Harry Pitt told me that he said to his son-in-law, well, I don't know anybody, but I'm gonna call a black fellow by the name of Senator Leroy Johnson and ask him if he knows anyone. See? So I got a call from Harry Pett asking me if I knew anybody or if I could get a license for L.E. to fight in Atlanta. My answer to him was, I'm not sure, but let me call you back in a couple of days and give you an answer. So I had the people in my law firm to search the law to find out if there was any law in Georgia dealing with boxing commission. To my surprise, there was not a law in Georgia dealing with the question of boxing or dealing with a boxing commission. If there's no state law, then what will govern in Georgia would be the municipal law, the area in which you live like Atlanta or Savannah or Macon or what have you, but it would be that law that would, would apply. So when I saw that, I called Harry Pett and said, Harry, I can get a license for Ali to fight in Atlanta. So he says, well, let me talk to my son-in-law. So he talked to his son-in-law, his son-in-law called me, and uh, we made a range for him to come down, and we met at the hotel, one of the hotels by the airport. 
and we sat there for six or seven hours and we talked about putting together a contract and we did agree on a contract and I my job was to get a license for him to practice I mean for him to box in Atlanta the hurdle I had to overcome was I had to get the city council the mayor to agree and then I had to get the governor of the state to agree then I had to have a place for the license for the boxing uh, match to take place so the first thing I did was to go to the city council and it just so happens that the members of the city council were my friends Marvin Arrington, QB Williamson, Jackson, uh, uh, Kasakas, uh, all, all the fellas on the, on the city council I knew and I met with each one of them and told them what I wanted to do. I wanted to get a license for Ali. They all agreed to help me. The next step was to go to the mayor, who was Sam Marcel. Well, Sam Marcel was my friend. I had helped him get elected. And, and we had a good relationship. So I went to the mayor, Marcel, and told him that I wanted to get a license for Ali. And, but the first thing he said to me is that, oh no, he says, that is just awful. He says, the White Citizen Council, the Ku Klux Klan, there's two harder issues. It's, it's, it's just, if, I, if we agreed to do that, we're going to have problems. So I let him finish, and then I said, Sam, there's an old saying in politics that politicians consider to be a truism. He said, what is that? I said, that saying is that you dance with the one who brung you. That is the, that is the basis of politics. See? So, so Sam, Sam, Sam stopped for a moment and he, he said, Leroy says, I, I think you're right because I owe you one. He says, on with the fight. And anything I can do to help you, let me know. But he said to me, it's not, I'm going, I will assist you, but you're probably going to be with the governor. I said, Sam, thank you. The, so I had the city council member, and I had the, um, the mayor. And the next thing was the governor. The, well, before I went to the governor, I called Carl Sanders, who was the governor of the state when I went in, when I got elected in '63, and I called. I said, it's "Governor, Governor Sanders," I said, "Here's the opportunity I have. I got an opportunity to get Ali into the get a license for Ali so he can fight in Atlanta." I said, "But some 56 cities had turned him down. This is going to be a tough job." I said, "But." I, before I go to see the governor, I wanted you to know what I was doing, and I need your assistance. I may need your assistance somewhere down the line. And Carl Sanders said to me, Leroy, uh, we'll go back a long way, and if I can do anything to help you, I will. But your problem is going to be with Maddox. See, I said, okay. So I, the next day, I, after talking to Carl Sanders, that I went to see Maddox, and I sat in his office, and I said, Governor, I need to talk to you about a problem that I'm having. Now, just before I talked to Maddox, the week before I went to see Maddox, Maddox's son had been arrested, and and um, had been arrested in DeKalb County for I think still is. Uh, things that go on a car, what do you call it, uh, some misdemeanor, but hubcaps, hubcap, killing hubcaps from a car, see? They had his trial two days before I went to see, see Maddox, and the governor in DeKalb County said to, the judge in DeKalb County said to Maddox's son, after going through all the evidence, said every man is deserves a second chance. So instead of sending you to jail, I'm gonna have you to report back to the court on the weekends. 
and uh, but there'd be no jail sentence. But every man deserved a second chance. And so he worked out something where Maddox's son would report to the courthouse on a certain day each week, a certain day each uh, for several weeks. But that was it. So when I sat there talking to Maddox, I told him I want to get a license for Ali to fight in Georgia. I told him that Ali was a, wanted, the only thing that he knew to do was to fight, that he, didn't want, he did not want to go on welfare. But Maddox was opposed to welfare. And I said, after talking to him a period of time, I said, Governor, every man deserves a second chance. And I think that had alienated, that, that had something to do with his thinking. Because when I said that, he looked at me and said, Senator, on with the fight. Mm -hmm. So I said, thank you, Governor. I walked out of his office. Harvey Murray, Murray from the WSB was outside. He said, Senator, what did the governor say? I said, the governor said, on with the fight. So the Atlanta Journal had big headlines that the governor said, on with the fight that evening. And by 8.30 or 9 o'clock, Somebody shot in my window. And I learned the next day that the White Citizen Council had sent letters to Maddox and had also sent letters to the state capitol. They sent it to his home and to the state capitol telling them that they were opposed to Ali fighting in Atlanta. See? So the next day, Maddox reneged on his promise and told the Constitution that Ali would not fight in Georgia. He had reversed his position. So I called Carl Sanders and I said, Governor, we, got, we, we have a problem. Maddox has reversed his position. He says that the, the, uh, uh, that the fight will not take place, that Ali will not fight in Atlanta. I says, I don't know what we're going to do now. So Carl Sanders said to me, let me give some thought to it and I'll call you back. Well, Carl Sanders had appointed the Attorney General. And when he left office, the Attorney General was still in office and Maddox kept the Attorney General that Carl Sanders had appointed. So Carl Sanders talked with the Attorney General. And as a result of the talking with the Attorney General, he called me back and said, Senator, read the papers in the morning and I think you'll be satisfied with it. The Attorney General, who was Attorney General under Maddox but was appointed by Carl Sanders, said that the governor had no authority to stop the fight because Georgia had no laws on its books dealing with the boxing matches, dealing with the fight and boxing matches, and Georgia had no boxing commission. That the only person who could stop the fight would be the municipality where the fight has been held, and that's the city of Atlanta, the mayor, and the city council. So when that came up, it came in the Constitution the next day, Maddox was asked by the papers and others, what are you going to do? And Maddox's answer was that, I'm not going to fight with the Attorney General. So that cleared the way with the governor's office. That means that we could then put the fight on in Atlanta. I then called Harry Pett and told Harry Pett that we had okay now, we could get the fight. He was originally Ali was originally supposed to fight with Frazier. And Frazier, manager, a fellow named Durham, had told me, so we went to we went to Durham. We went to to Philadelphia to see Durham. And I called Marvin Arrington, asked Marvin Arrington to go with me to Philadelphia. And he said, okay. So we flew to Philadelphia. We talked to Durham. And Durham said that I don't believe you can put him in, you can have him to fight in Atlanta, because too many states, 50 or more, had said no, he will never fight. 
He said, the only way we would agree to have Frazier to fight him, that you put him in an exhibition fight before the time of the real fight. And if you do that, we will, we will consider Frazier fighting him because Frazier was the one that they wanted. So we left there, we came back to Atlanta, and that was our task. How can we put him in the ring before, before the main fight? We had only one place in Atlanta was large enough, and that was the city auditorium. We didn't have the, the, the um, we didn't have the facility that we have now in Atlanta. We didn't have the dome or anything like that. We had the city auditorium. The city auditorium would hold only 5,000 people. So I said to Jesse Hill, I said, Jesse, we don't want to go to put an exhibition downtown because the White Citizen Council, the Ku Klux Klan will attack us and we never put the fight. We never get the fight in Atlanta. We got to have the exhibition someplace was that where, the, where we can say that the uh, White Citizen Council and Ku Klux Klan would not come. So we're getting to thinking, where can we have it? And I thought about Morehouse College. The president of Morehouse College then was Hugh Gloucester. Hugh Gloucester was my personal friend. So I called Hugh Gloucester and said, Hugh, we can put Ali into the ring if we can give him, if we can have a place where we can have an exhibition fight. Can we have it in Morehouse? And Hugh said, Senator, I'll call you back in 10 minutes. He called me back in less than 10 minutes and said, you can have it here at Morehouse. You can have an a, a, a exhibition fight here at Morehouse. I said, okay. So we went back to Philadelphia and talked to Durham. And Durham says, yeah, I told you that, but I don't believe it's going to happen, so you're not going to be able to fight with, with, uh, uh, with Frazier. And he reneged on his promise in terms of having Frazier. So I came back, called my people in New York and told them what had happened. They said, we have to get somebody else. So we got Quarry. And Quarry became the person who would fight with, uh, with Clay, with Ali rather, at the time. Even when we had the exhibition at Morehouse and Ali fought two people at the exhibition and had a long line of other people who fought at the exhibition. But even after we did that, uh, Durham, who was the manager of Frazier, said, no, we're not going to let Frazier fight him. So we said October the 25th, 1970, for the fight at the city auditorium with Quarry. When the fight came, 5,000 people only could go to the, to the fight itself. And we had fights on the screen in other places. The, but at the auditorium, we had only 5,000 people. But on October the 27th, October the 26th, 1970, we were successful in Ali fighting Quarry which was the fight that returned him to the ring. And of course, after that, he became again the, the world champion. But that's, that's how we got that fight. And that's the process we had to go through to get it. But uh, it was one of the things that I think that, that was at the top of my list of appreciation, the things that I had, to, had a role in doing was uh, was getting that fight uh, for Ali. And that's it, Councilman. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us or put on the record? Anything at all? Doesn't matter what subject. Uh, hey. That? One second, let me swap it. That one is closer to your face, I apologize. Glad you have breakfast. <laughs> <laughs>
Got to. All right, we're ready. Thank you. I'll count two in. Yeah. Three. Okay. Two. Last thing that I want to say. The okay. The last thing I really like to is to point out to say is that the other lesson that I learned during my experience in the Senate of Georgia was this fact, that the perception of power is as effective and as great as power itself. If you are perceived to have power, it is in fact as if you had the power that you may not have. But I learned that out of an experience that I had uh, in the Senate. I had a bill that I had introduced in the Senate and my Senate colleagues voted against the bill. And there's a rule in the Senate that if you have a bill that come up and is voted against, you can take the floor and ask for reconsideration, and the bill has to come up the next day to be reconsidered, and you have an opportunity to pass it. So I put my bill in, they voted against it, I asked for reconsideration, and the bill would come up the next day. So that evening, I went to the, to the Senate and we have what we call a watch line in the Senate. You can get on that line and call all over Georgia. You don't have to pay for it. You just call, see. And I call members of the, of the, um, of, of the, we had an organization called the Georgia Voters League. The Georgia Voters League was founded by A.T. Walden. Black people could not become a part of the Democratic Voters League. I mean, the Democratic party, uh, even though white black people were a part of the Republican Party, but black people were not a part of the Democratic Party. So A.T. Wallen found the Georgia, uh, Georgia, uh, the, uh, uh, Georgia Democratic Club of all black leaders uh, throughout the state. Now there's 59 counties in Georgia and about I guess maybe 20 counties, we had members of the Georgia uh, Democratic Club in Augusta, Savannah, Macon, uh, and, and South Georgia, and what have you. Wallen was the president of the Georgia Democratic Club. I was assistant to Walden, and when Walden passed, I became president of the Georgia Democratic Club. And I had these members of the club all over Georgia. So when my bill was defeated on the, on, the, on, the, on the Senate floor, I went to the watch line and began to call members of the Georgia Democratic Club, black folks all over Georgia, Augusta, Macon, and all South Georgia, and told them that I wanted them to call that senator and tell them to vote with me on tomorrow for my bill that uh, they were opposed to my bill and likely the bill of any thing that had to do with, with helping the black people. So I did that until about 11.30 or 12 and I started at six on the watch line calling leaders from throughout Georgia, black leaders throughout Georgia. When I walked into the Senate the next day, one senator from Athens, Georgia, Senator Brown came up to me and said, Senator, 
I had two people to call me last night to ask me to vote for your bill. And it says, I don't like that. I don't like to be pressured. And I want you to know that I don't like that at all. So I said, Senator Brown, I understand your position. Thank you. And uh, they called the bill for reconsideration. And the first person to vote to reconsider my bill was Senator Brown from Athens. And other senators voted with me. And the bill came up and passed out of the Senate. Senator from Enigma, Georgia, came up to me and said, Senator, you got the greatest organization in the state. I had senators call me, I had members of, of the black community call me and ask me to vote for your bill. See? And say, you you can you you, you got a powerful committee. I said, thank you, Senator. Now, I learned from that experience that the perception of power, they thought really that I had the power, and it was an effect, the perception of power is as effective as power itself. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that we had the organization, but the organization was not functioning, and, but I had all the contact with the people that was in the organization, and as far as and that and that spread it that 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 concept that I had power and authority spread it throughout the Senate. See, I never sought to discourage that at all. <laughs> I permitted that to go right ahead. See, uh, but I didn't have the power. They thought I had, but I was perceived to have the power. And the lesson I learned that in politics, the perception of power is as great as power itself. But that's what I just wanted to throw out, uh, Michael. The, very good. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. This has been wonderful. Oh, it's been my pleasure. And, and thank, thank you for you. allowing us to come.